Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Disaster Philanthropy webinar, Survivor and Community-Led Response, Putting People First in a Crisis. During the webinar, you may hear speakers refer to this as SCLR. My name is Tanya Gulliver-Garcia. I'm the Director of Learning and Partnerships at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. My work combines my practical, academic, and philanthropic understandings of disaster. I describe myself as a disaster junkie, and my work is grounded in principles of equity and an understanding of how the intersections of race, gender, sexual orientation, happy pride, by the way, age, disability, and class impact the lives of individuals, their families, and communities. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will answer them at the end of the panel presentation. If you are on Twitter, please use the hashtag CDP for recovery. That's CDP, the number four recovery to share and join the discussion. And don't forget to follow us at Funds for Disaster. At the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey, and we ask that you do complete this to help us improve our webinar offering. And finally, we are recording this webinar. It'll be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is completed. Live captioning is available now via Zoom. You can click on the closed caption or live transcript uh, button to access it, but more accurate, represent more accurate captions will be in the recording next week. Now I want to thank our sponsors, Alliance Magazine, Giving Compass, Human Rights Funders Network, Peak Grantmaking, Philanthropy New York, and the United Philanthropy Forum. We thank them all for their support. As we begin the webinar, CDP acknowledges that it works on the stolen lands of many original people. We recognize that Indigenous peoples have been displaced and disenfranchised from their land by the socioeconomic and cultural impacts of colonialism and disasters. And the erasure of indigenous knowledge about how to care for these lands has caused environmental destruction and degradation. CDP is committed to dismantling the ongoing legacies, systems, and structures of settler colonialism and white supremacy and their connections to philanthropy today and in the future. Despite centuries of theft violence, and murder, this is still and always be Indigenous land. So please join us in acknowledging the original people, their elders, past, present, and future generations. So Adrian, if you can um, close the poll and we'll show the results in a couple of minutes. I just want to remind everyone of our learning goals. These were posted on the um, profile for the webinar. At the end of the webinar, you should understand the principles of survivor and community-led response, aka SCLR, Under increase your awareness of LCR activities and the impact of funding these initiatives, and learn when and how to invest in SCLR after disasters. All right, Adrian, if you want to share the poll for us. All right, so about one third of you have said that you're aware, about 15% very aware, 25% neither aware nor unaware, 17% unaware, and 6% very unaware. And I would definitely have put myself in the 6% very unaware before I started working on this webinar. So I think uh, for the speakers, you've got a really good mix of people um, across the spectrum to talk to today. And so now it is my honor to introduce our special guest, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So first we have Mandeep Mudhar. She's an independent consultant with over 15 years experience on humanitarian resilience, programming, and strategy. She supports local to global protection with its research and practice around SCLR. Mandeep also works with individuals as a transformation coach. And this means that in addition to working with local actors to ensure protection and survival during humanitarian crises, she also works with individuals to help them live with authenticity, purpose, and joy. Guy Cave is president of the Legatum Foundation, overseeing philanthropy for Legatum, 
which is a purpose-driven global investment partnership based in Dubai. Guy has 30 years of experience in social work, international development, humanitarian response, and philanthropy consulting. He's worked for several international nonprofits across multiple countries on five continents. And then Endicacho Aragel, also known as Endy, grew up in a remote, rugged, isolated, and rural area where communities are nurtured with dignity, endurance, and moral values to lead their lives and ensure self-development. He has an academic background in rural development and 23 years of practical experience with bilateral and multilateral in more than 10 international non-government organizations. He's now recycling that experience to work for the National Civil Society Citizen to Citizen Development Organization in Ethiopia. So I welcome each of you and thank you for taking time to share your expertise with me. And I have to say, I'm so excited to talk to everyone. I've worked in locally led initiatives domestically for a number of years in mutual aid or community organizing, but it's not an area I was familiar with at all in the disaster and humanitarian space. And in talking with all of you, I really learned how similar and yet unique too this concept is. And I think um, as we talk about it, domestic funders are also going to um, get things they can take away, even if this isn't a space they've worked in yet. So to begin, Mandeep, let's start with you. Can you give us a grounding in SCLR? What does survivor and community-led response actually mean? Thanks, Tanya. Um, so first and foremost, SCLR recognizes that people in communities in a crisis are the most significant responders to that crisis and are always the first and last ones there. It's an approach and a set of tools developed over time and experience that empowers and enables people to lead their own efforts to survive, to recover and to protect themselves. Um, as you can see from the diagram that gives an overview of the approach, Survivor and community-led crisis response is much more than the micro-grant providing function that is often known for. In essence, SCLR protects both the space and the resources within which people can define and lead their own ways of helping each other, acting on their compassion and providing often life-saving mutual aid. We've seen the benefits and impacts of empowering people's own efforts throughout a multitude of crises across the world. And in almost every context, people feel a greater sense of dignity, well-being and togetherness. In practice, small amounts of money can have a significant impact on a large number of people. We're talking about individual microgrants of probably up to the value of $5,000. But the numbers can't really paint a picture of the impact and the change that emerges from empowering local response, which includes greater confidence and belief, inspiration, stronger trust and relationships, horizontal accountability, greater social cohesion, and in some cases, even movements towards peace. Thank you, Mandy. Um, that was a great overview and I look forward to diving in a little bit further. Guy, can you tell us why this is a good um, you know, option to use in crisis and conflict settings? Sure, I think, uh, thanks Tanya. And thanks, Mandeep. I think what it really appeals to us is exactly what Mandeep was saying, that because uh, communities are always the first and last to respond, and this is an approach that just seeks to build on that and support what people are already doing. Um, so it's appropriate in any kind of crisis setting. And then because it's community-led, community-owned, it's the community groups that get to decide where the money goes and they control the whole process. It's therefore always responsive to the local needs because uh, it doesn't need an external kind of situation analysis and so forth. It's, they know what's needed locally. Um, 
One of the things we found as a, as a donor to this approach is that although it is well suited everywhere and we are trying to support it in multiple places, it's really well suited to particular situations such as if mainstream aid is being restricted. So, for example, we support it in Myanmar, where obviously the government, the military dictatorship is trying to control aid to certain areas. And we found it as a really effective ethical way to get support to some of the most uh, vulnerable uh, acute crisis kind of communities or places where there's huge insecurity and so it's hard for mainstream aid to respond like in Sudan at the moment there are amazing self-help groups uh, doing work in Sudan and we're proud to be supporting a group that's working with them another reason we like this approach is as you give kind of second wave or third or fourth fifth micro grants it enables communities to really think about resiliency and moving into kind of addressing root causes so it kind of keeps away both from aid dependency but also enables communities to kind of not be stuck with the kind of donor artificial divide between humanitarian and development kind of sources of funding um i don't think it's you know the be all and end all i think it's a tool that one uses alongside other forms of aid um, and we've been really excited by by what we've found through funding it in the countries that are listed there currently. Thank you, Guy. And I think that that moment when we can really address root causes is so important, especially in decreasing risk after a disaster or before a disaster or crisis. Andy, I want to um, go to you. When we had our planning call, you said something that that really struck with me. And um, I want to actually make sure I quote it. You said, the way people behave is the way you engage them. And I was really struck by that. So I'm wondering if you can expand on that for us. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, thank you, Mandy. And thank you, Guy, for the, for the good explanation as well about CSLR. Yes, I think the that is really very important, the way you really treat people, the way they really behave. Because if you really treat people as helpless, unconnected victims, increase really ownership and also increases dependency. And But if you truly really treat people as a potential leaders to really prove their own solution and also about collective self-help, that's really where they really start to really do. So about it is about community spirit and the compassion. It's about local solution and also the wisdom and use of their ideas. So it is, it's, it's about not really downsizing the energy and the capacity because people have really the capacity to do that for their own. So what we do is in that to really make sure that we don't really do a need assessment, rather we use opportunities around the communities and help the community to behave about their, their, the way that they have to really challenge their own Solution. So local people knows far better than any external assessment that we can capture. So we, we try to develop the, the, the working languages. Actually, in our local language, we call it like nine M's. It's about empathy, about compassion, about cooperation, collaboration, discussion, helping each other and listening and supporting each other. Because this is a very important language when to really make people to really behave the way that, that you, they behave. So that's really the important uh, elements we have been really trying in our uh, grassroots perspective and implementation. Thank you. Um, Andy, I'm gonna stay with you for the next question. Um, you know, when we, we talked, you, you told me some of the work that Citizen to Citizen is doing and how you're really highlighting, you know, that local knowledge you just talked about. So can you tell us about some of the activities your organization carries out? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. That's very important as well. We do because we have, we, we as I said, we do strength based and opportunity based uh, sort of what we call it an appreciative inquiry. And the reason that we provide a micro grants best common for the community action plans. And this is really a kind of a spirit transfer of power for community. And we have seen really the improvement of social integration and also relationship that's really within the social system that really focus on dignity, helping each other, and also inclusion and kindness. 
So it also helps the community to retreat the psychological, the social, the psychosocial recovery systems. So we think that given the chance for the community, they have they respond to holistically and also in multiple ways. Because they are people have a natural tendency for what they call it in, in development terms, a triple nexus that's about humanitarian assistance, development programs, and also about conflict management. So this is what we say, and we have learned from the communities that community-led responses is much faster and more cost-effective. It's about less money, more support, more people. So it really confidence also increases confidences. And it helps also to dream high for the community. They, they will not change, they, they start to be challenging, really wait and see mentality, rather for, because like it was like for traditional donors, but rather it's really accelerated this long-term process to address the root causes, so many things. So it's, and also we have learned about successful women, the emergence of also emerging of successful women groups that really become a model for so many villagers. So it we have also another important thing that we have learned from the when we do these things that partners start to see the benefit of about mindset, trust and integrity. Also it amplifies the social cohesion. And we have seen robust action plans that comes from the village. I think those are really very important things that we have learned from the when we work in the village. Thank you, Andy. And um, CDP is very proud to be um, one of your donors um, for this very important work um, that you're working on. Mandeep, I want to come back to you with something that you said when we were preparing for today. You told me, now is the time for change. Change is happening from the bottom up. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that? Sure, I can. And I would follow Andy any day of the week because I love what you just said. Um, and you've made a lot of the points that um, I would like to make in, in, my, in my brief uh, response now. Um, so the international aid industry emerged from and still has a very crucial role during crises, all in support of where local capacities are overwhelmed. However, it's grown to such a level that these local capacities and efforts are often sadly overshadowed and in some cases hindered or harmed. But if we're truly recognizing the central role that people play in ensuring survival and recovery for both themselves and for those around them, we have to return to a balance of power. Uh, and despite international commitments, um, we're just not there yet. The COVID pandemic showed that now more than ever is the time for change, mostly in our attitudes and behaviors. Because of what the international community said it needed to do to rebalance this power, it's, this is, we're already seeing this happening at a local and national level. So like we've heard already, we're seeing right now how much people in places like Myanmar, Ukraine and Sudan are relying on each other. It's the moral duty of all actors, including international actors, to trust in the power and decision making of ordinary people, citizens and groups in the local population and a shift from focusing on participation to really recognizing and making space for the agency and leadership that already exists, which actually starts with stepping aside and letting go of control. And as our Moving sister in, uh, in Kenya said, Dorare in Masabit County in Kenya said, uh, release the power, let them use it. Absolutely. One of the things we always say in, in a natural hazard type disaster is that all disasters begin and end locally. And I think when we move into humanitarian space, we sometimes forget how important it is to have that connection and conversation and think about the assets that existed long before you came into this space and, and the way that it was working. 
Guy, I'm, I'm going to go to you next. And you also said something um, completely fascinating for me. Um, as I said, this was just a great conversation with all three of you. Um, but you said, we want to come into this with the mentality of serving people, not saving people. They're not victims. So why does that approach appeal to Legatum as a foundation? Sure. Thanks, Tanya. Um, and I think there's multiple reasons, but I'll, I'll draw on two here. And one is exactly that. It's about our values and actually building on what Andy and Mandeep have said, you know, one of the things we talk about at Legatum is that everybody has infinite value. And therefore, everybody has dignity, everybody has agency, everybody has the right to control their own lives. And this for us is a approach, uh, as Mandeep and Andy have said, that very much respects that. And, and that's where it starts from. And I liked the fact that you chose as, you know, the subtitle of this webinar, putting people first in a crisis. And and that's what I think this is about. Um, so it's an approach that is in line with our values. It promotes local ownership and resilience, which we seek to do in our philanthropy. Um, and I think the more we've looked into it and the more we as a foundation have have looked to to support local organizations, et cetera, is, as, as people have already said, how the aid is given really matters. It's not just about what's given, but how it's given. Um, and we feel that if we can come into or support local NGOs to come into communities that have been affected in a crisis and see how they can get behind what they're already doing, serve what they're already doing, rather than, uh, you know, as Andy said, you know, seeing them as victims and then for, you don't really seek to put people who you see in your head as kind of victims into leadership uh, and let them control and own it and just trust them with everything. So it's all about the values and the mindset that we like this approach and it's in line with us. And then we're an investment firm actually at our heart. And so from a very kind of business approach, it makes sense to us. Um, and I think this is building on what Andy was saying in terms of product differentiation, you look for, you know, what's the fastest, cheapest, uh, most effective, highest quality way you can do something. And we feel that this ticks a lot of those boxes as an approach. Um, the subsidiarity principle in business is around letting decisions be made as close to, you know, the, the to the lowest level possible, the lowest uh, by the people who are closest to the issue impacted by that decision. So all of that uh, kind of feeds into it, um, as well as a desire to kind of support, like with any kind of cash-based approach, supporting the recovery of local markets is also important to us. Um, so yeah, that's why we like this. Yeah, and I think that's that's so important, um, this, this concept of fastest, cheapest, but also really most effective. Right, being on that local level. And Guy, I'm going to stay with you for a question I have for all three um, of the panelists. What advice do you have for funders who are, are thinking about SELR for the first time and investing in it? Yeah, great question. And I think as I answer this, I'm thinking mainly about people like us who are kind of philanthropic donors, but it probably ap applies more broadly as well. Um, I think for us, we feel that philanthropic money is, is particularly well placed to support an approach like this, um, because I think it should be fast and innovative and flexible. Um, and, you know, in such a large, whatever it is, $35 billion, you know, annual budget across humanitarian response, philanthropic money with the best will in the world is always going to be a tiny fraction of that. So how can we have the highest best value add in that approach. And I feel it's by demonstrating a different kind of approach. Um, and for us, that is about putting people first in a crisis and saying, it's great, you know, the system needs to change, there needs to be more localization, et cetera, et cetera. But what if we, at least with part of our response, don't kind of just try and tweak the current system, but actually just start with where people are at and what communities are already doing and as you know, Mandeep said, build up from the ground up kind of thing by getting behind them. I do think that donors getting involved in supporting this approach need to leave a sectoral focus behind. I think you can have a geographic focus and say, we want to support this approach in X region or X country. 
But I don't think it's suitable if you're saying we want our money to be spent on livelihoods or we want our money. This is money for water and sanitation. It has to be money that says this is money for the community to decide what they need most and what they want to spend the money on. So I do think donors need to let go of that um, and recognize that actually there's a whole lot of tools and approaches that are key. But I do feel in some ways it's the mindset and the values behind SCLR is one of the kind of key changes that people need to have. And then the only other thing I'd say is like, let's learn together. I think this is a, it has been going for a while. There's that great paper that Local to Global Protection that Mandeep works with, uh, did with, uh, with ODI a couple of years ago now that kind of summarizes a lot of the experience over a decade or so. Um, but I still think it's an emerging practice. So let's learn together. Um, and also, Legatum as a donor is really keen to collaborate with others. So let's try and take this to scale. Uh, you know, Legatum has, we're already, you know, aligning funding between Legatum and Center for Disaster Philanthropy um, and with Vittal Foundation and hopefully others are coming on board soon. So one of the things Legatum has done in other sectors is to start uh, pooled philanthropic funds like the End Fund and Luminos Fund and uh, Freedom Fund with some others. Um, I think that this could be an approach, an area that is also suitable for a kind of pooled fund of some sort. Um, so I'd love to talk with other donors and get do this together with others. And I can learn from your experience as well. Um, I was really struck, though, by something you said about meeting people where they were at, which is a key principle in harm reduction. And I think in, in talking to all three of you, you know, one of the things we talked about was just how humanitarian aid and the way that it's been done traditionally has harmed people because it does take away their autonomy and their ability to show that leadership and, and to do you know, the, the work themselves um, with their community. So Mandeep, um, I wanna go to you with a similar question. What advice do you have for funders on their role in adopting SBLR? So I'm going to repeat myself and say it's great to follow Guy um, and he made all of the points that I was going to so I have no need to speak but I have the floor so I will speak. Um, this is a great opportunity actually to speak directly to potential and future funders of SCLR so thanks CDP and Tanya for organizing this opportunity um, and actually putting together a group of like-minded people that are all saying the different things from a very different perspective. Um, but back to the point that I want to make, um, as we talked about releasing the power and handing over resources to local and national actors, the beauty of SELR is that it takes localization commitments even further beyond established organizations, right down to crisis affected people. People like uh, ND mentioned have the natural tendency to consider other people, think long term and respond holistically. So to potential funders, in addition to the usual calls for flexible funding, longer term investments, and connecting directly with local practitioners. Again, great to follow you, Guy. Um, I want to highlight four words specifically. Um, you can read the rest of my points in your own time, but specifically, I think the first is listen. Um, genuinely listen, trust, and be led by people affected by crisis. Uh, the second is adapt. Allow people and plans to adapt which includes being able to take risks, try things that might not work and learn through the process. The third is unlearn, unlearn top down or jargonistic language or rigid ways of working so that we can make space for SCLR in conversation, in plans and in practice. Uh, and the fourth is change, be willing to change your roles your procedures and mindsets, and this fear of we need to continue to exist, which is really very harmful. Um, and finally, like, like Guy mentioned with this um, growing connection with other funders, 
um, tell others that are flexible and like-minded like yourselves with whom SCLR might resonate about the approach and bring them into conversations that are genuinely exploring opportunities to support SCLR. I think that's that's really important, that last piece. I mean, all of it was important, Mindy, but that last piece about telling people, because sometimes people just don't know that this is an option or an angle or a way of doing it, and so they haven't um, really thought about it. So I'm going to go to Andy in a second, um, but I want to remind our attendees, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those in just a few minutes. So Andy, what have you seen that could encourage funders to adopt this approach? Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, it's really great to speak after uh, Guy and Mandy. And, uh, Thank you for the uh, Legato Foundation, CDP, and also Vital Foundation for this, that really opened the space and the trust you have really on us. That's really the important message because we have really tried. Imagine if we don't really be trusted and if we don't really get that space, how we can really learn all those things. That's really uh, being like with really being really connected with the Legato Foundation. That was really the, the first message I would like to say. And for funders, I think that's really the, what's really the, the, the thing that I want to really um, make an advice, trust on the local actors and in the community. That's really the important thing. So they can change the whole system. As I said that, uh, before, because if you really give the, 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 the decision power for the communities, they have naturally have really a tendency to really, really act on the whole system not only single issues, but they have really the, the capacity and as well as the knowledge and they have really rich knowledge and uh, the skills as well. So that's really the important thing. And the other is, it has, I think, shifted the thinking, build on the local initiatives and the recognition of local capacity. And it is also good to really for funders to have this shifting thinking on true and equal partnership. That's really very important message I would like to also stress what's really Mandy and Guy say. And that's really important, of course, it's already said by uh, Mandy, it's letting people to really safe to fail. Let us really learn from the, from the reality and let us test it. And then let us really learn from, from, the tri from our trial. So that's really important. So we can really learn from the, from the grassroots perspective. And the other is, I think funders, I don't know why it is the importance of really giving money without intermediaries. Just give out the money for the community, for the grassroots people, instead of just giving the money through intermediaries. So that's also one of the important issues that I would like to uh, stress. And give the space and the resource. Be flexible, as, as Guy said. Don't really just restrict us. Be flexible because let us also adapt the reality. That's also important because we have to really doing new ways of doing it. And let us really starting to learn learn new ways of uh, the things. So that's really the important message also to really like to really transfer for the donors. Encourage the bottom-up planning. That's really important because as I said, people have the capacity, the knowledge and the skill. And I think, as, as Guy said, let us also be genuine in terms of localization. Because everybody nowadays are really talking about localization, but let us really make it as much as possible really genuine. And let us also believe on communities' decision-making power. They make really a decision that really, the life, really values for their, their own lives. And I think funders and donors has to also create an enabling environment and voicing for donors and government to give a space for community to practice. Because the donors has to also revisit the policies, the rules and regulations about community led development assistance. Those are really very important issues because in, in, in all the, the, you go, there are so many bureaucratic chains and rules and rigid rules and regulations that is not really allowing local people to really learn from their practice. So those are really some of the important items I can really complement this guy and Monday. Thank you, Annie. 
Thank you, Andy. And, you know, I think back to our conversation a lot. Um, you said here, letting people um, be able to fail, making it safe to fail. I think it's also about making it safe to succeed, right, and, and celebrating that. And one of the stories you told me that I yeah. have told so many people is about a, a village in Ethiopia you worked with and did an action plan with that community and gave a micro grant to them. And then yeah. they came to you and told you that they'd gone to the next village. And they themselves had asked that village to create an action plan and we're giving them a micro grant. Yeah. So it's succeeding beyond even, I think, your organization, right? Because they're yeah. able to do that themselves and and peace building and security and, and I mean, strength development to the, the utmost level. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Just pointed out that because that's what I was, the way we really engage people really, the way they are starting to behave because we were just trying to really give micro grants for the community. And then they started to give mini micro grants to the next village. That's really very important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions uh, we had in advance, and I'm going to alternate between the questions in advance and the, the questions that uh, are coming into the chat with a focus on the ones asked by funders, is what kinds of wraparound support are provided to make it SCLR? So beyond the money, is there additional technical um, assistance or other support? Maybe Mandeep, do you want to do you want to tackle that or Andy? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm I'm happy. <clears throat> excuse me to to kick us off. Um, so we have this software within the SCLR toolkit. Um, which is really, as Andy mentioned, taking a strengths-based approach to looking at existing capacities, so using um, appreciative inquiry. Um, also within that is locally sensitive ways of doing risk mitigation um, and finding measures of, of doing less harm. And at the same time, um, like Andy also mentioned, and Guy, encouraging this attitude and this environment of it's safe to fail and to actually we want to learn from the process. But the biggest wraparound support is, is actually the accompaniment and the mentoring that's provided to groups that are leading their own initiatives. Um, and that's at one level. The other level is the upskilling and the mentoring support that is provided to organizations that are new to SCR facilitation. So those is those are some of the wraparound supports um, around SCLR, as well as um, local to global protection is in is is trying to invest in local, national and regional communities of practice that actually link SCLR practitioners with each other. Um, so that's another uh, form of, of wraparound support. Andy or Guy, did you want to add anything to that? Maybe Guy, you will come later and just to summarize that. I think what Rimandi says is very important. We couldn't really do all these kind of things if local and global protection was not really there. Those researches, those expenses, those package lessons from different countries was really very important for us really to try because that's really the eye opening for us and uh, it was uh, very important. And that's a reason also, I think the experience sharing that we do from, from village to village is also very important. Every time we really update our knowledge and skills, how we can be facilitate. Because with, I said, as I said, the most important thing is really learning. So the learning we're trying to do, what we call it experiential learning and reflection sessions with the community. That is really very important. That's why this, the local global protection and research units are also providing us those things that are very important. So we, we, we are trying to really new things. And then those lessons was uh, really helped us a lot to really procuring all those knowledge. And currently we're starting to what Mandy said, the, the community of practice in the East Africa, and we came together all the practitioners every time on, on monthly basis. So we deliver our experiences and we challenge each other and we try to really see new things. So those are really the important factors I think to really consider. Thank you. And maybe just- Did you wanna maybe, add? Yeah, just one little thing that I realized may not be clear for people who for whom SCLR is new, 
is the way that we fund this is obviously we're not doing the community micro grants. We fund a local organization or local partner, such as Citizen to Citizen led by Endy in Ethiopia. And we have multiple ones in the other countries where we're working. And it's them who provide that support to the community groups, do the mentoring with the community groups, apply the approach. So for any funders who are thinking, okay, this sounds great, but there's no way I would get to the level of funding community groups. It's all done through a, you know, a local partner that then provides that support and the wraparound that Mandeep and Andy talked about. Yeah, that's really important, especially for funders who don't have capacity to make micro grants or, or to work in communities and know the community like that. Um, one of the, the people online asked um, your perspectives on how we could think about applying these concepts to disaster response, especially in the U.S. What what are the, are the pillars, I guess, or the principles that might be transferable? I wonder if yeah. you're the best to answer that, Tanya, in a way. I, I mean, because I think CDP take this kind of approach, you know, in, in, in the U.S., from my understanding, and have that kind of mindset as well of, you know, commu helping communities. I think, like I kind of said at the beginning, building on what Mandeep had said, my experience, I think our experience is in every country and every culture and every type of crisis, the first people to respond to the local communities. And you see amazing collective compassion or mutual aid or whatever one wants to call it. Um, and I think therefore getting behind this, that the people at the center of the crisis and supporting what they're already doing um, would I think totally apply in the US, but I'm, although I'm based in the US, I don't know much about responding to crises here, so. Um, if, if, yeah, if, if I may, um, we're talking about SCLR as an approach, as though it's a brave new concept. Um, and like uh, Andy mentioned, you know, it's a new way of doing aid. It's not. Helping, helping each other and helping people is the oldest thing that we 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 practice as a human race, um, and in particular, I'm going to go back to the COVID pandemic because I think that was a crisis that every pocket of society, every corner of the world, was impacted by. Yes, some more um, unjustly more than others, but every person in this in this world experience the effects of the pandemic. Um, and as a result of that, we actually saw compassion and mutual aid really being brought up to an international level and people talking about it um, in a way that it just seems so natural that I would help my neighbor and in my neighborhood more than I would think about perhaps another country, which is quite different to the way that we think about um, crises uh, and, uh, and emergencies. We always think about, oh, it happens over there, but actually when we're affected by it, we forget about all of these names and these different approaches. Um, it's all about compassion and mutual aid. And I think COVID was the one thing that really demonstrated to us that actually we all have it within us uh, and it's part of uh, our human nature to actually extend help to others, especially those people that we share space, immediate space with. So I don't think it's a brand new concept. And I think it very, it very much will relate to people in America. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And one of the things that we saw um, during COVID when mutual aid did expand so dramatically was the way people then took mutual aid groups that had popped up and used those in the next natural hazard or severe weather event because that structure was already in place and the relationships were already in place. And I think, you know, the work that, that Citizen to Citizen does and, and that you've all talked about, you know, is about building those connections, right? It's harder to reject somebody who needs assistance when they are your neighbor or they are somebody that you've worked with you know, on a project before. Hey, another question, and Andy, maybe you want to take this one. Um, how do we make sure that the communities have the power to make decisions themselves without the influence of government or political pressure? So how do we not make this all about the politicians or the government and let it be led by community residents? 
Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very important question. I think the, the, the thing is because we started what we call it on the existing structures, not really any structure that is really money can be really manipulated by the local uh, governments. Because when I say existing structures, it could be like long or generational structure or community uh, based organizations. So, so, so those are really very important structures because we didn't really go there to really organizing communities. Rather, we say it's a strength based approach because we have to refine out where is the really strong con con community uh, structures are really there. So, that's very important, I think, the first thing. And the other is we have also uh, have really a com what we call it in the first, we go from the village, we do some awareness for the local. Uh, for the politicians, for the influencers. This is the way we do things, and this is our approach. And so we do really a kind of um, common understanding and bring into the same page to really understand the, the approach we really implement, use to the, when we go to the community. So sometimes, by the way, we in our case, we call it Ersho. It's just a kind of uh, yeast that can be used to really make injera, the local staple food, and also bread, because we can't, we can't really have, I can just give them for the people to say essay that because that's not another point. So we try to really put it into the, the, the local context to really fit it. So we call it yeast and that I'm an issue, that's really very important. So it is a yeast to give for the community to make their own injera or a staple food. So with that, the local actors are really starting to understand. While I am talking today, I can give you an example. Today, the community has got for the first time a, a micro grant from the local treasurer, from the government to their account, which is really incredible for me. It has, it has never been happening for the last many years in my uh, care. But today, they signed a contract agreement. They got to the citizen, the community groups, and the local government signed a contract agreement to transfer money for the group. So it happens. So it's really because now they're starting to really appreciate the communities, how they are really doing an incredible job by their own. And they have seen how they are really making decisions. And they have seen how the collective actions are also doing some meaningful things on the ground, on the village. So they're starting to appreciate those things. So I think step by step, you can, you can really change the attitude from the, from the government and from the politicians as well. I'm sure it's not really easy, but it's coming. For sure, never easy, is it? Um, Mandy, did you want to add in? Just, just um, a quick point, and I think it's a very good question. Whoever it was that asked that, um, just a quick point to make a distinction between political pressure and the government. Um, I think the, the point that I want to emphasize is working with government can actually be a good thing. Um, we've got many of our um, peers and friends in different organizations, and I'm thinking about um, some organizations in Ukraine, the Philippines, and in Palestine, where actually through the work that community groups have been doing themselves, and working with organizations like Citizen to Citizen, so those organizations that are facilitating SCLR, um, the relationship with the local government and the local administration has actually grown quite strong. And that's really important for a whole host of reasons, not to least to mention members of local government are members of the local community. So how, how do you make that distinction and that separation of no, we don't actually want it, we want to have independence from, from government where actually local administration are members of the local community themselves. Um, that, that growing um, relationship between local administration in particular is really important for the future of um, the future of the role that the local administration might not be able to provide right now, but actually is something that we're working towards and working towards building the capacity of the local administration to ultimately be able to take on the responsibilities that they should be able to take on. Um, and also it brings people, um, groups, uh, civil society actors and local administration much closer together, which is only a good thing, can only be a good thing, where that's a positive and well-balanced relationship. So I just wanted to make that, that bit of distinction there. 
Thank you. And Guy, I have a question um, that we received in advance I wanted to ask to you. Um, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but somebody asked, can you discuss how the benefit of local support compares with the global disaster relief organization's ability to leverage global logistics and supply networks as well as their experience? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as I kind of touched on before, it's not that this is the be all and end all. If, if a humanitarian response requires, you know, a large in, internally displaced people's camp or, or refugee camp etc i don't think that's best left to individual small community groups to run and set up etc and that's where you know there's a need for mainstream aid for some other types of the projects i think the bit that's been overlooked as we've said is is what communities are already doing before actually anybody even comes in with and gets their global supply chains and stuff uh, set up even with the global supply chains obviously you know and i think slowly the system has got better about this around trying to kind of support local markets rather than just ship stuff in um so it's not that uh the two can't coexist but i think where we've got things wrong and i think this is accepted in the whole because of the whole localization debate and so on is is putting people at the center and empowering people and actually starting with where people and communities are at. And so I think that's the big advantage of this is knowing what is needed locally, being able to be fast in getting that and being really truly community owned, community led. Um, Great, and I think we have one last question, which was, are there any laws or rules that govern this kind of grant making, this kind of process that is different than normal funding um, in a community. I don't know who wants to tackle Guy as a as a funder. I don't think so. I mean, so on a kind of donor due diligence level, we do our due diligence in the partner that we support to do SCLR. Um, and then not, I don't think you can do it down to the micro grant community level, nor should you. Um, so, but I don't know of any laws that would apply in this situation. No, and if you'll allow, yeah, if you'll allow me to come in, um, that's very much contextualized and it's based on um, the location and the crisis context in which um, SCLR is facilitated. Uh, so thinking about Ukraine, um, there were certain restrictions there around microgranting, which meant that the local organizations that were facilitating SCLR found a way to adapt the approach bearing in mind the flexibility of the approach, but given the realities of local legis legislation during that during the, the time of the crisis, or that particular time of the crisis, had to find ways to adapt the approach to um, work around those or work alongside those restrictions, which didn't deter them from being able to work with, with communities. So there, I wouldn't say there are international laws, um, it's very much contextualized on that crisis context. Um, but I'm, I'm really um, comforted um, and grateful to hear Guy mention, you know, taking on that risk and liability from, from the donor's perspective, but also working with the organization that is facilitating SCLR on being as flexible as possible and, take it and sharing the due diligence that way. And I think Guy raised at the beginning as well that you know, being able to give directly into communities and the groups that already exist there is really important when perhaps, you know, larger NGOs can't get into a country, you know, um, if, if there's a crisis and, and it's been determined, you know, that their organization won't let them travel there or there's a restriction or, or something in place, then, you know, we're using the, the power of people um, that are already there to, to do this work. And Sadly, this is all the time we have for questions today. Um, I want to thank our speakers. This was an amazing conversation. And I want to provide the audience with some, some takeaways that I gathered um, as I talked to Andy and Guy and Mandeep ahead of time. So one is to revisit 
the power and centrality of your role in the funder-grantee relationship. As our speakers have talked a lot of SCLR is about changing who is in power and moving it from just being an international NGO to supporting local and national actors. And similarly, funders must also ask what's needed in community and fund that rather than coming in with their own programming or their own agenda. Trust is huge. One thing I heard over and over when I was talking to the speakers and during today's session is how important trust is. And if we want trust, we have to give trust. And we need to earn trust by showing trust. People inherently want to help their communities and they will look out for the group's best interest if they are given that opportunity. And then I think our speakers have addressed this really well today. Adapt the principles to your own context. As I said at the beginning of the webinar, I've been doing work similar to SCLR for years in a domestic context. And while SCLR uses microgrants as a tool, and it's just one of the tools, the underlying value is letting the community determine what is needed for recovery. SCLR is asset, not this deficit based, and that's the same for mutual aid around the world. So CDP has a number of resources that you can call upon to support your work. Uh, we have profiles about various ongoing humanitarian crises, as well as natural hazards. We have a playbook for resources. There's a monthly newsletter, regular blogs, including our weekly What We're Watching blog that highlights disasters around the world. Staff team is always available to provide guidance. And if you need more depth assistance, we have consulting services. Uh, we support the local humanitarian leadership secretariat. And you can find information about that on the website, as well as the network of disaster funders for those of you who are working in the U.S. doing um, most of your work in disaster funding. And there's also a localization toolkit in the playbook. So lots of resources for you to check out and learn from, and you can get those at disasterphilanthropy.org. So our next webinar is gonna be on July 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern, and it has a focus on the gendered nature of climate change. And then following that, join us on August 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern to discuss disaster case management, navigating recovery one person at a time. And we'll be highlighting one of our newest resources, which is the toolkit on case management. So to respect everyone's time and keep this to an hour, that is all the time we have for today's webinar. Thank you to our co-sponsors and to Guy and Endy and Mandeep for taking the time to talk to us. Don't forget to do the survey. It will already be popped up on your screens as soon as you close out, so I know you can see it. But that will help us know what to put in future webinars. And if you do have questions or thoughts, and I know we didn't get to all the questions that you want to have addressed, um, you can email them to me at tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. And I know this is the longest uh, email address. But thank you and have a great afternoon, evening, or for Andy, a very, very late night. We appreciate you.